On behalf of the Virgin Valley Historical Committee, I'd like to welcome uh, welcome you out tonight to our Founders Forum and uh, our viewing audience at home as well. This is the fourth in a series of discussion. Talk with some of the longtime residents of our community and uh, record and preserve sort of oral histories uh, of the area and get some of our questions answered. And uh, as our guest speakers tonight, we have Wilverna Pulsifer Levitt and her sister, Katie Pulsifer Lee. Um, the discussion tonight is going to be moderated by uh, the noted his local historian, Vinnie Levitt. And uh, so without further ado, I'll turn the time over to Vinnie. Thank you. Let's see. I've been noted for quite a few things. <laughs> You're noted for much good. Um, we are happy to welcome you out tonight and uh, welcome you to, if you can't hear, let us know because sometimes they get afraid to get up close to the microphone. And we have quite a few questions and as soon as they get so they're not so nervous, uh, maybe we'll even ask if you have some. But we would like to welcome well, Verna and Katie, and also express appreciation to the city of Mesquite because uh, though many people aren't here tonight, these are very important, I believe, very important uh, records to have on, on hand for later on. Well, Verna, I'm going to ask you most of the questions to start with because of the difference in your ages. <laughs> but then we'll get to the point that I'll just say, well, okay, Katie, how was it with you on that same question? All right. So, well, Verna, would you tell us just a little bit about, you know, your parents, your, your father and mother, and your grandparents on each side, your parents' parents, <coughs> who they were, wh where they were located in the valley, and kind of what was, what, what did they do in the valley? What was their occupations. Do you want their name? Yeah. <clears throat> Excuse yes. me, do you want their names? Yes. My dad's name is uh, Charles William Pulsifer. My mother is Nevada, Nevada Hardy Pulsifer. Dad was born in um, Hebron, Utah, and mother was born in Mesquite. Okay. How about their parents? Let's go back to a moment. Let's see. Grandma Hardy was a Levitt, who isn't? <laughs> <laughs> and Grandpa Hardy, his name is Charles Milton Hardy, and his parents were Caroline Lucy Blake and Warren Hardy. And let's see, who did I leave out? Uh, Grandma and Grandpa Levitt? Yeah, well, you have Charles Milton and Lorena Levitt Hardy. What did, what did Charles do in the valley? What was his occupation? Oh, Grandpa, when they first moved into Mesquite, you know, they just helped themselves to the land, these guys did, and they kind of divided up, and Grandpa Hardy had acres and acres of uh, grapevines over where, maybe why part of the library is now. And then he also had uh, hay and grain, and then he also worked in the grist mill, too. Uh, grist mill here in Mesquite. That was the Arizona Peacock Mill, the one up on the ditch. I suppose. Yeah. And then your your uh, father's parents was Charles and William. Kate. My dad's name was Charles William, but his you want his yeah, parents? Yeah, his parents were Charles and and Kate Pulsifer, Bowler Pulsifer. Um, his name was Charles Pulsifer, and my grandma Pulsifer's name was. Kate Bowler Pulsifer. And what did they do in the valley? Well, Grandma Pulsifer came with the rest of the Bowlers on the ship to the United States and rode a train out to Milford, and from there they had to take a covered wagon. But uh, the Pulsifers came over on a covered wagon to Salt Lake, and then Brigham Young sent, when they began to get too crowded, Brigham Young sent Pulsifers down south to herd the uh, church's cabin. 
and that's how come they migrated up into Utah and around here and they followed the feed. And then when she got here to the valley, did Charles lived in the valley here? Dad? No, Bill, your dad's father, did he live here in the valley? No, they went. But he went all of them up to Hebron, Hebron and, that's where and then Grandma and Grandpa moved down to Gunlock, <clears throat> and that's where our dad came from. Okay. But he was born in Hebron. Yeah. Hebron, for those of you who may not know, is uh, out be right next to the Enterprise Reservoir. Uh, if you haven't been there, you ought to ride up one day. Check it out. Okay, you just made an interesting uh, little uh, dodge there that I'd like to to ask you about. In all my life, I knew your mother as Nevada, an Aunt Vade. So how did she get changed from Nevada to Nevada? Well, I suppose they started calling her that Vade. You know, they shortened everything, but mother's name was Nevada, and she was proud of it. That is a, a, a valley, I don't know what to call that. But everyone in the valley seemed to soon get a nickname, and they called nicknames instead of real names. And those nicknames is how everybody seems to remember. Uh, in your family, how many children did your parents have? Three boys and three girls. And where are you? I'm the second one. You're the second. And your older sister, Sylvia? She passed away. Passed away here a few years ago. And then Warren Pulsifer and Howard Pulsifer and Frenchie Pulsifer and then Katie is the baby. Her and I are both babies. <laughs> now, there's another thing that, uh, just just for the interest of it, uh, we talked a little bit, up, a bit about it, but uh, you have a brother named Frenchie. How do you get a name like that? This is a little ticklish, but I guess it's not at all. I'll tell you. Dad wanted to name this baby Bert. And he really wanted to name him that. But Mother says, if you'll take him up to have him named, you can name him what you want. But there was a cook over to Mark and Jack's service station, and his name was Frenchie. Now, Mother had no connections with him, but she says, Right out of the clear blue, if you don't take him up, I'm going to name him Frenchie. <laughs> Dad didn't take him up. <laughs> He's a good guy, too. <laughs> Frenchie is. Um, He's had to live that all his life. <laughs> okay, and so then your parents got married in Salt Lake City. They did. And uh, tell the story there. That was an interesting story of how your mom got your dad to marry him. <laughs> dad came down with Hazel's dad. Uh, dad came down and they lived just across the street from where Grandma and Grandpa Hardy lived and, and he stayed with Uncle John David and Aunt Lizzie and Jack Hardy and, and my dad became pals and he invited Dad over to a party over the Hardys. I think the Hardys had a party whenever they wanted to because Grandpa was quite well off. And uh, Dad went over and he met this lovely girl. And then Dad went off to work and they kept in touch with each other. Uh, it seems like Mother went uh, most of the way to Bronzeville Mine, but Dad went out to Bronzeville Mine to work. Where is the Bronzeville Mine? Where was it? Where is it? Where was it? Where was the Bronzeville Mine? It's between those two mountain ranges out there. Okay. <laughs> and by mule team, it's a long ways. Okay. And that's the way they hauled the ore out, is by mule team. And uh, Jack and Camelia were going to get married, and Mother heard about it, so she wrote Dad a letter and said, you come on in, we need to go with them and get married. <laughs> and she always bragged about proposing to Dad, but there's a little secret there. She, I said, why did you do that, Mom? She said, well, I knew Dad was going to ask me. He sent for my uh, ring size. So, you know, she didn't just do it all on her own. And they did just that. They got married, and then they moved to Arden. When did they move to Arden, Nevada? Uh, and why? I guess they moved there as soon as they could. There were a lot of people from Mesquite that were down in Arden. 
But Dad was fortunate enough to get a good job. He was um, an engineer on a locomotive that hauled freight ore from the Blue Diamond Mine down to the, the mill by the Union Pacific Railroad. He made a lot of money. He made $250 a month in a house. And the house must have had four little bedrooms, I can remember, but it was a house to us. And we were really quite rich, in case you didn't think we were. <laughs> and uh, me and two brothers were born down there. And if you'll forgive me for saying this stupid thing, I remember telling my friends that I was born in Arden over to my neighbors on a trunk. My mother had to get up in the morning and go over and bring me home. <laughs> now, it sounded good to me, if my playmates could believe me, but I don't know if they did or not. Um, How long did you leave in Arden? Live? Twelve years. We were there twelve years. Two of my brothers were born down there. And so I understand that when you moved back here in 1930 that you moved right into the house on the corner up there. It was already here. How did that happen? Well, they bought this piece of ground from, it seems like a bunker. I need to think about that. Anyway, they bought this acreage down there, about four or five acres, and they had presence of mind enough to build a good house. It was a good house. It wasn't just thrown up. Of course, uh, Grandpa Hardy and Uncle Walt Hughes, and one end of the front room was 10 inches off the carpet, but that was okay. <laughs> <laughs> we, we, we had to know that we didn't have carpet, but we had to cut the carpet to make it last, uh, rough fit. They did it through the times, that's why I know. <laughs> and when they came, of course, they had a good home, but in the meantime, they had rented it to surveyors and were surveying the road up and down. And they had to wait until they moved out, and they just kind of stayed with Grandma and Grandpa for a week or so, and then they, we had a good home to move into. We always had a good home. So they were wise enough while they were making that big money. While they were making that good the money, they yeah. built this good home. To come back to. Uh, again, for those of you, uh, this home would be sitting right on the corner next to the Chalet Cafe where that new strip mall is. That was where their home was. When you were in Arden, can you describe what Las Vegas looked like when you went into town? How far was it? What was it like? What did you do when you got in town? Arden was 15 miles from Las Vegas. And Dad used to take us in uh, probably once a month to see the movie Rin Tin Tin. <laughs> and Mother screamed bloody murder because I think Dad probably had to pay 15 cents for our tickets. <laughs> And then after we went to Rin Tin Tin, he'd take us down to Hefner's soup place and buy us a bowl of soup, which is really good. Now, I remember all these things, and that's what is on my mind. Even though Mother screamed about it because we wasted money, he still took us in. And they had, in Las Vegas, I remember they had wooden sidewalks, and they had just a dirt Fremont. Fremont Street was... But it was solid dirt. It wasn't, you know, soft dirt. But I didn't think nothing about it. I know Dad told me if I didn't mind what I was told, he'd let Sam Gay get me. Now, Sam Gay was a sheriff. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, when you, uh, when your parents come back, what did your dad do then for an occupation? Um, tried to farm. They couldn't live on that. I think Dad said when they moved here, they had $800 in the bank. They thought they could live on that forever, but they spent it before they knew um, they didn't have any. But we had, they raised everything. We lived on what we raised. We didn't go to the store for anything. And then Dad, Dad and two or three others were always hunting a job and never found any. But you know, Dad was gone a lot hunting a job. Eventually, he did get a job on WPA. What does that stand for? Anyway, he worked on a bridge down there for a while, and and then he farmed a little bit, and uh, then he ran a um, thrasher and a machine that he cut the grain. A binder. Binder. That's what I'm thinking of. In fact, he. Went to Gunlock and Santa Clara and St. George and all around and, and did it for money. 
you know, but the Jack and Mark owned the binder and the thresher, but Dad worked for them. And then when they sold that, Dad bought a truck and went into the trucking business. I don't think he made any money, but at least he was trucking. And everyone used to go for Bill Pulsford to bring him something from Los Angeles because he was always trucking things back and forth. When I was, when I was talking to you, you made a, something I had never heard before. Uh, you mentioned the turkey truck. Tell us about why you mentioned the turkey truck and what it was. Well, turkeys are the dumbest sounds that <laughs> they can be, according to Keith Levitt. <laughs> they had to put adobe marbles in their feet to get them to eat. But the, Keith Levitt learned to raise turkeys, and Mark raised turkeys, and I can't remember who else. But I know those two did because they were family, and they uh, got them ready till just before Thanksgiving, then they hauled them into L.A. and sold them, they hauled them live into L.A. Well, that was good, because Mom always hitched a ride down and back with one of them all the time. They could expect Mom to go down, and if we were good enough and she could find a sale, she'd buy us each a dress, and if we weren't good enough, Silva got a dress and I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> so you were probably the only girls in town with dresses from Los Angeles? We did get dresses from Los Angeles now, we, but the, you know. Most people went to Sears Roebuck in the catalog. But well, you, we uh, bought everything Boston. out of Sears Roebuck in the catalog. We got all our school clothes and everything out of the cheap sale. <laughs> uh, so there was, there were turkey farms here. In the there back. were turkey farms. And they actually then shipped they them out. They fenced in their whole big fields and let those turkeys run. And during this period of time, when the turkey farm was going and your dad was starting trucking and so forth, what was the most successful business in your eyes at that time in town? I mean, what were the businesses in town that you remember? I guess the service stations are beginning, beginning to bug up on every corner and, and then they were having like <clears throat> a little something to eat in the service stations. And then people sold their fruit and stuff on the highway, too. Uh, the store, where was the store? You said you never went to it, but where was it? Houston Trainer had a store. Where was it? Um, it was about where the, well, what's the name of that saloon down there? That North barn? West? Oh, that's where it was, down there. It was a... He had everything, including the post office. Can you remember the first gas station in town? There was an actual gas station. That, you know, Probably Alf Hardy made that one on the corner for the first one. On this corner or the upper corner? The big one where you go around the turn, he made it this way, not this way. Okay. Uh, when you went to high school, be careful. <laughs> when you went to high school, what, what were the big activities in high school in those days? I don't know. I love sports more than anything. I read the sports uh, page now first. <laughs> What's your favorite sport? Um, Whichever one's on? Baseball. Hockey. Uh, I don't know. I'm not horseshoes. I couldn't lift them. <laughs> So in high school, uh, the sports at that time was what for the boys and what for the girls? Well, basketball was a big thing. If we went to a basketball game, we, we were so hoarse when we came home, we could hardly get in the door. <laughs> did you go to the ball games alone, or did your parents go with you? Oh, Mom and Dad didn't go to anything. <laughs> Dances? But they didn't go to anything. I don't know why. Maybe they, I don't think they can afford it. But there were big crowds in the ball games and dances. Oh and yeah, that was that was that was the thing. You don't miss a ball game. <laughs> <laughs> Not even now if you can help it. <laughs> so, how did you and uh, Harley? Harley was from town here. How did you happen to get engaged? I mean. How do you go through that process in old time to ski? 
And what? In old time mesquite, how did you go? Did they well, draw names? Or we both went happened? to high school together, and, and of course he was ahead of me, but I'll have to tell you, Mr. Randall was the name of the principal, and I was in, I was in geometry, don't mention it out loud. <laughs> and Mr. Randall looked out the window and he saw Harley and Bud Harley walking along. He says, now look at those two boys, they'll never be nothing but sheep herders. <laughs> I was offended. I never did forget, so I was looking then. <laughs> so you, you lived on the wild side then? <laughs> no, I was on the wild side. <laughs> <laughs> so you and Harley got married. Yeah, we got married. And uh, then the war come along, and Harley went off to the war. Can you tell about that? Well, not very much. He only went to Hawaii. <laughs> him, and, him and Mike Burns, Harley worked in maintenance, and Mike worked in parts, I think. One on one end of the island, one on the other. And Mike could get a Jeep. Harley couldn't because he was in maintenance. But they got together and enjoyed each other very much. He was in the Navy, right? He was in the Navy and Mike was in the Army. And the Navy trained him to do what? To be a mechanic. But uh, before he went to uh, Hawaii, before he was shipped out, he was in San Diego and they sent him to an um, advanced diesel school in Goldport, Mississippi. And he was visiting when he should have been listening. <laughs> and so the instructor called him to come up and time a motor. Well, that was, you know, first thing he didn't bother him, and he walked up and timed the motor and come back and sit back in the crowd. He was honor man out of that class, and I have a certificate to prove it. Good. So he did. He never did turn out to be a sheep person. Either. No. In fact, one day we drove around town in Las Vegas, and there was Randall was. Street corner, we picked him up and drove him around the block and left him there. <laughs> we weren't afoot. <laughs> so, during World War II, can you describe what uh, life was like here in the valley? I mean, rationing was going on, wasn't a whole lot of traffic, I suppose, going up and down the highway. Uh, I still got my ration here. books, but they're all used up the shoes and the sugar and the tires and the gas, that parts are all used. So, was it really hard here in the valley then, or was it just I don't think normal? we suffered too badly. Had just about all you'd always had. I guess. So, when Harley came back from the or from the Navy, he started a garage. He did. Right where it is now. Yes. Can you tell about that. Well, he built two little stalls, no doors. First, at first he just had hand tools he packed back and forth on his mother's porch. And he did that for I don't know how long. And then he decided he was getting better, so he slept down there. And yes, there were people that came in who didn't have any doors on. But after a while, we had put on doors where you, they were wooden doors where you pull them up with a, a rope, Dewey Hart built those doors for us, and they were nice. And then eventually, he built a big room on for parts. We lived in that. Terry remembers that. And, and then, you want me to tell you about what he's building now? Yes. Well, you know, these miners around here, they mine for gold up in the Bar Hills for a long time. I don't know how rich they got, but anyway, when they left, they had this great big tin building up in, um, up in Cabin, is that where it was? It above was up, Cabin. Then. It was above Cabin, and Harley bought it from them at a very cheap price. Nevertheless, it was up in the mountains. So he went up and looked at it, and he asked somebody about bringing it down. They said, oh, they could, in three weeks, they could bring it down. And so he gathered up people that were good with him, like Vaughn and Boyd and I can't remember whoever went with them. They went up and tore this big, big tin building down by number, put it on pickups and tra uh, trailers, 
and hauled it down over that old gravel rocky road and brought it down here to Mesquite and put it back up by number. And as soon as we could, we put cement blocks with it. And it's still there today. And then the, the last thing on the garage right now, the park from Las Vegas, the gas station. Tell about that. The what? The, the uh, shed or the back, the part of the gas station. Well, there was a, a gas station on, seemed like Tropicana down there that went out of business. And he had this great big uh, shed. And we bought it from him for $1,500. But we, we didn't want to tear it down to bring it home, so we hired these trucking people to bring it to Mesquite. And they had to bring it during the night because they couldn't come through the underpass there at Apex. They had to go along the railroad tracks and over and across and uh, down up and come up here during the night when the trains were not on the tracks and they had to get permission to do it. And then he brought it up here. And I have to tell you that you're not going to like this, but he spent more time trying to get the county to give him permit to build four little pads to put it on. That sounds true. That's what happened. <laughs> All that thing up here and had it there and then spent a lot of time to get those four little cement pads. Okay, uh, Katie. <laughs> uh, you, you were... You were born in St. George, right? Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I thought it was in, I thought it was interesting that uh, uh, well, Verna's family had one child, Sylvia, when they left Mesquite, and she was her mother was attended by a midwife. They go down to Arden, and all three of the children down there are born with doctors. And they come back to Mesquite, and the next child born has to be born with midwife again. No. In the. He, no, he was born in the front bedroom of that house over there yeah. with the doctor, and the doctor's name was Dr. Cook. Cook. That's what I haven't run into. I've run into Gilbert and a couple others, but not Cook. Okay. Was he in the valley then, or just. He lived here for a while. Oh, okay. Frenchie was born there. So you were born in, in St. George and then grew up in Mesquite, and in the Mesquite that you grew up in, it was still two-lane highway, and you come off the Lynch Hill, and just describe for us the terms of the business, if you can. You come off the Lynch Hill, just like the Lynch Hill is now, except it was more crooked, and you didn't want to pass anybody, but you did if you was going up the hill. And um, you came around um, <clears throat> by the graveyard, and there was a service station right on the corner on the right. There was a big, big, long, sweeping corner there that comes off okay, and it was, the was sand hill. Today. I can't think of the name of that station. It was Colton's Col station. Oh, yeah. yeah. Thank you. Thank you. And you just went down the street. It wasn't a big, fancy street. And when you got to the turn, there was a blinking light there all over. <laughs> at all times because, you know, people had a tendency to forget to turn and they would land in our front yard. <laughs> so, no. but the blinking light was there, you'd think they'd seen it, but you'd, you'd be surprised. <laughs> I, I can remember when that blinking light was a big, probably four feet by five feet or more cement painted white and black stripes with a big light going both ways blinking and people kept hitting that thing. <laughs> Colton Station, there was no businesses coming down until you got to the corner. Was there? Mm, I don't think so. So then you got to the corner and what businesses were there? Well, as you made the turn, yeah. there was a little uh, gas station across the street. And next I think to Claire you? Hughes owned it at the time and then there was the corner, corner bar. Uh -huh. and, and then there was the motel next to that and Mark's house. But uh, right next to us was Vonda's Cafe, and it was there as long as I could remember until now. Yeah, and Vonda's Cafe, as you come down the street, what were the next businesses? 
Well, there was a house there um, next to Father's Cafe that used to be a yeah. hotel. The next to that was the Wagon Wheel. Wagon Wheel Motel. Mm -hmm. And then Face Cafe. Face Cafe. And across the street by the Golden West was, was what? In your high school days? Well, at first it was a little grocery store. Remember, it was. Um, OP Skaggs. No. Well, it was a Skaggs, but it was owned by. Um, East, East, East. No, before that, we took my husband. Oh, Deloitte Avenue. Deloitte Avenue. Deloitte Avenue. Deloitte Avenue. And then Eastman's bought it, and then they turned it into a. Um, it was a soda shop. Soda yeah, shop. Yeah, that's what it was. So. And the next business to it then was Sylvan's Cafe, Sylvan's Garage. Yeah, Hughes's Garage, and across the street was Hughes. The Hughes Motel, Elmer Tilley's Motel, and they also had the post office. Post office was over next between the station and the Hughes's garage, right? Or was it the post Not it was right here. First. It was in the right in their hotel. In the motel. The motel. And then they moved it across the street. Mm -hmm. Okay. Then the next business was <laughs> Jail Bowler Store. Yes. And the next Go business jail. after that was. And across the store, street from Jail Bowler store was a telephone. Little, little telephone place. And the hospital. Oh yeah, the hospital. Next door to Jail's was the Desert Palms Motel. Mm -hmm. <coughs> then you went down and there was uh, Harley's Garage. There was Late, a frost spot first, they built that. Later there was, uh, there was Harley's Garage, but we, yeah, in our high school days there was Moss's Mm -hmm. uh, hamburger place there, and the uh, La Mesa Motel across the street. And then I don't think there was any businesses until you got down to Freezer Cafe. No, there wasn't. And after Freezer Cafe, and, and that little station that was next to it, just down below it, and the Richfield across the, the street where the truck stop was, that was the last business in town, wasn't it? Well, the station, the one right next to Fisher Cafe, it was there for a little while and they closed it down. Yeah, that Shell station. Yeah, they closed that down. Yeah. And then there was a truck stop across the street from right. Fisher. Well, wait a minute, though. There was Fighting Brothers Station down on the corner, and Nephi Jensen had a little frost stop across the street. And the Blue Dot. That wasn't. The Blue Dot Cafe. Blue Dot, well, that was Freezer. Blue Dot. That was Blue Dot. Blue Dot was there. And there was another gas station there, too, wasn't there? Another gas station next to the Blue Dot, that was uh, Clary uses also. Oh yeah, I forgot that. And then there's the famous motel. Yeah. Started out the Dinell Motel, then it went to the Lazy L Motel. You guys were both connected to that, weren't you? Can you tell us about that? My, uh, Bernie and her husband owned it and my parents run it. Right. And I was the chief worker. <laughs> so, how did it go from the Lazy L to the state line? I mean... Well, you, Vernon then sold it to Dave Anderson, and I think he sold it to the state line, I don't know. He, still, he sold it to... Uh, Robbie Robinson. Robbie, so. yeah. Robbie Robinson, yeah. And then it went to the state line. Who... And, and this is probably yours, Will Verna. Uh, gambling became legal in Nevada and you know most of the businesses when I was a kid had slot machines in. Not some of them didn't, but most of them did. And uh, but who brought in the first gaming, you know, actual gaming tables and things this way? George Harmon. George Harmon and he had a wire. He what he 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 had gambling down. What's the name of that thing again? Golden Valley. West. Golden West. Only then he called it he Valley. He bought that, um, and he made a little cafe in the back. Of course, that was just a blind. And then he was able, through politics, to get a gaming license here in Mesquite. Now we could not keep it out. We did try, but politics were beginning to be too strong, and Mesquite just couldn't keep everything out. We tried and we did everything we could. But George knew his way around. He came from Cleveland. <laughs> <laughs> and he called the place the Valley Inn. Yeah. 
And he called the place the Valley Inn. Valley Inn Casino. And then he had a Valley Inn Motel later down, that's still down there on the hill, or on the road. So, okay, now, Katie, tell us about your high school. Uh, what were the sports during your high school days? Baseball, basketball, and track. Is that all? Did they have any girls' teams? If a girl was interested in sports during your day, what happened? Maybe baseball with church or something, but no, not school. Did they have girls' teams when you were in school here? What? Girls' teams in the high school? Not competitive, no, just with each other. Because it's interesting to me, it wasn't, uh, I don't know why, but in 1920-21, Virgin Valley High School girls team won state championship. And, uh, yeah, but then all of a sudden we had no girls teams. Uh, what, Katie, how come we didn't play football? <laughs> well, this was kind of before my time, but no, they didn't have a, from what I can understand from my dad, that... They didn't have a coach to coach it at one time because they used to play football because French played and I went to the games. And then all of a sudden, I don't know what happened that they didn't have a coach to f for football. And so the whole time I was going to school, we didn't have football. And I know that the year when we were seniors, we put in a petition to the county school district to have football. And I think it was not, it could have been the next year, but I think it was a year after that that they finally got football back. I remember we tried to play football and they wouldn't let us, said we'd get hurt. But I, as I've been checking back, it seems like it would have cost so much to get all the football gear that the school, which was Educational District number one then, wouldn't allow us to have a football team. But when we got, became part of Clark County School District, then we were able to finally start having football teams. Well, I know our class put a petition in for it because we wanted to play. We put it in early too, but we I can remember in Bunkerville uh, at the school when I was a sophomore, they called all of the boys into the auditorium, freshman through senior, to vote whether or not we wanted football, and we all voted we did. And uh, the coach, Coach West Hughes at the time, stood up and says, well, we appreciate your vote, and we'll get back to you. And we didn't. <laughs> but I think it was because of the, like I say, the money. Was but we didn't, we didn't go on a vote. We, sent a, we made a petition and we sent it in ourselves. And we did have a, they'd had a big um, meeting at school with all of us, including the teachers and the one coach, and it was, I wish we'd had a tape recording. <laughs> it was pretty interesting. We didn't back down. Of course, I wanted you to know that I'm not the one that done talking. <laughs> <laughs> but as far as girl activities like that, you was either in the pet club or cheerleaders, and that was about it, right? Mm -hmm. FHA, future. Homemakers of yes, America. Yes, you could be in that. Right. But how did you like school? How did I like school? Yeah, I mean, if you compared your high school days to what you see your kids are doing in high school, would you say yours is as good or a lot worse or what? I had a good time in high school. I get. I think it's what you make of it. I don't. I didn't know any different because we didn't have all the activities. There were a lot of things to do in the ski. I still had plenty to do. Yeah. Or now they're so busy. They have everything to do, but I still, we, we just had a good time. Yeah, I, I can remember we had to make a choice. We could have algebra the first half of the year, and biology the second half of the year, or the other way around. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, now, Harley has got the garage, work is going along, your family's all settled, you've moved into the home you now live in on, uh, what's that street? Willow. Will, okay? And Harley was always involved in community. He was involved in everything going on, community, uh, state, county. Uh, he led out in about everything. Can you tell us a little bit about kind of some of the things he, he spearheaded, ran through, from the town time to city time? Well, he was on the town board constantly. And where do you want me to start? 
Well, the first big thing I can remember is uh, sewers. But I don't know if the streetlights come before the sewer or the sewer come before the streetlights. The, I think the streetlights were here before the sewer. The sewer was one of the big things for the city that he was after. And that it was there him. before it was a city. And so he, he made a lot of trips out. I went with him. I, I know where Las Vegas big sewer pond is. <laughs> and he went to the people that knew how to do it to find out. And then he was politician enough that he knew where the politicians were. He had to go to to find out what to do to finance these things. And, and he did work real hard on the sewer. Uh, I can't tell you how much about the street lights or the sidewalks or I know that um, I can't remember all the things he did, but he was involved in everything one way or another. But he loved it. He loved all these things. What about the uh, uh, park? The what? Mesquite's first park. Well, he insisted on having a park. And after he got a park, then he wanted it named after James G. Ryan, Sailor Ryan. A lot of people objected to that, but he felt like since Mr. Ryan had been really good in helping him do things, that he was entitled to the park. The name? Yeah. And where is that park today? Which, which of the parks today is it? I think it's the one they're using up there today. Right up at the end of Willow Street. Uh, what about the cemetery? Oh, he, he was really proud of the cemetery after they got it cleaned up so they looked like a cemetery. Las Vegas was all the time sending their indigent, indigent people over here because they couldn't afford to be buried in Las Vegas and they just sent them up here to be buried. So he called whoever and said that won't happen anymore. Now you bury your own people. We're going to bury ours here and you can bury yours down there. So he didn't let them bring any more people unless they could pay for it. So he stopped that. Okay. And the clinic, first clinic in town? Well, he was uh, on the board. I don't know who else was with him. I, I can think, but they assigned him, they wanted to make a clinic and use a trailer house to get started, just as a beginning. And Brother Allen, he was school principal, but he was on the board, I guess, and he would build onto this trailer house. So Harley did um, hunt around and found a trailer house in St. George from Brother Mathis, and it was $8,000. Woodbury, the same Woodbury that's down there today, told him go ahead and get it and he would see that he got the money. That's Commissioner Woodbury. So he did and they brought it down and they, um, Mr. Allen even built the extra rooms onto it and they were in this clinic working and it still wasn't paid for. Well, you can uh, know that he chewed out. That's not very good language, is it? Anyway, he got after Commissioner Woodbury, and finally he said, or else, and I don't know what else meant. I don't think he was going to hit him in the head, but he needed it. But anyway, the county did give them $8,000 to finally pay off that. And then, after they got this started, it was really successful, and we did need it. Then they moved from there up into the old gym up there. And, um, behind the stage, I think, and they had a clinic up there. You know the rest. But these people don't. <laughs> <laughs> well, we needed, we needed a clinic really bad, and they were constantly working at it, and so, and, uh, Tom Price ran that. We called him Dr. Price all the time, and we went there for quite a while. And where did we go from there? I don't know where we went from there. Where was this first clinic located? Up the in the trailer house. <laughs> behind the city building, right the other city building. It was right behind on the city property. Okay. And it was built 
and the rooms, and it was a nice place for us to have because we didn't have anything. So, in the city of Mesquite today, uh, you get looking around in Old Town Mesquite, the old Mesquite, and you see all these names. Who named those streets? They won't really want me to tell you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, okay. Marty was on the town board. He was always on the town board. I've got a whole book of certificates where he's on the town board, besides all the other things he did. I think Faye Levitt was uh, over the town board. What do you call the one that's over? Chairman. 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 I think Faye Levitt was chairman of the town board. And he gave all an assignment. He'd been to a board meeting, and he came home one night, and he had this big roll. And this roll was a town map, the map proper of our town that's, that we live in, us people. Never mind. Anyway, he said, the, the board assigned me to name all of these streets and have it back by the next meeting. Now, they met once a month. Would you do it for me? Sure, I'll do it. Well, bear with me. I did do it. And I tried to make all the streets in Mesquite proper to fit something in Mesquite where it belonged. And I just didn't reach up and pull them out of the air. I tried to make them fit Mesquite. And I did name all of these Mesquites. Now, those are up in the Sand Hills, and those are down on the <laughs> river I had nothing to do with. But those that went both directions all around here, I named. So if you don't like, <laughs> if you don't like your street name, you'll have to go to the city and have them change it. But I mean, yeah, and, there, there are two streets that yes. were named wrong. Well, when I got, I named them all, and I had the first one off in Fremont, and the one on this side, and I said to Holly. I don't know what to name these streets. I just don't want to give them a family name. I want to give them something else. He's really smart. He really was smart. Um, he said, well, let's name this one first north and this one first south. Then we have a direction that we can point to to go to other streets from these two streets. So that's what we did. That's where he got first north and first south. And all the rest of streets. And the only request we had was Jim Poults for um, James Hazel's brother made the request that we leave the Poultzifer name on Poultzifer Lane because Lou Poultzifer owned all that. He owned all the acreage down there and everything else. And so we named that had been named Poultzifer Lane. And he asked if they would leave it. And they said yes. They thought that since he had, because he owned all of the property that the, that big hotel and all that's on down there, all those places down there, Luke Bolster owned all that ground, so he was entitled to something. And so that's why the Bolster name is still down there. And you named one Arrow Weed. Oh, Jimmy. <laughs> <laughs> down or by the, I think it's by, is it by the post? No, it's not by the post office. It's uh, the one. It's named Arrowhead. Um, that one went clear to the river, and on, there were big cottonwood trees on both sides of it. It was a lovely lane, and then there was a ditch, and on the ditch there was millions of arrow weeds on both sides. Well, I named that lane Arrowweed Lane. So when the county made up the sign to come back Arrowhead Lane, now I don't know whether they didn't like arrowweed or just made a mistake. But I decided I liked arrowweed better than I did arrowweed. Now I asked Penny, do you know what an arrowweed is? He said, yes. Well, okay, I hope you do. But I'm glad it's arrowhead because it goes up by our churches and up through town. Uh, why did you name Smoky Lane Smoky Lane? Oh. <laughs> because. Um, What Easton's name? Lawrence? Lawrence. Yeah. They called him Smokey. <laughs> and they, the reason they called him Smokey because he was a meat cutter. And I guess he fixed hams and things like that. He provided for the places. And they called him Smokey, and it was just a short lane. 
So he was entitled to that because he lived right on that. He land. lived there, and he had more acreage on that land than anybody did. He had the biggest part on that end, and so we named it Smoky Lane. Okay. Uh, tell us, as Harley got more involved in looking towards the city, uh, probably Harley Levitt, if anybody had to be named the person that pushed city harder than anybody else, it was Harley. What was the first driving force that made him start saying, you know, we've got to get out of this county and do our own stuff? Oh, do you really want me to tell you? <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, he began to think about that there was a liquor tax, a room tax, a gas tax, and taxes coming from many different things, and they were going into the county. And he kept thinking that we were entitled to those taxes in our town in order to make it better. But he knew that we had to have enough money in order to support ourselves and get things going for this city. And you want me to go farther? <laughs> so anyway, uh, we counted the houses up and down the street, on both sides of the street, and the people that lived in the houses on both sides of the street. And then we did it again and again and again, and we tried to divide it up into three wards. Those wards are what would have been voting wards. I have papers with all those things on, I look at them and I think, oh, happy day. I wish that thing wasn't on. <laughs> anyway, uh, we worked on that a lot. Now, I didn't help him go around with the petition to ask people if they would sign in order to incorporate our city. I'm not very good because Holly and I were sent around a lot of times for the church to gather up finances, and I always stayed in the car and sent him in. <laughs> so he was, uh, I didn't go with that. I didn't want to have what people were going to say. I'm a coward. And they did go around and get uh, signatures enough to go ahead and start these things. So we sent these houses and people and wards into, I want to say the name, but I can't remember it right now. And they sent it back and said it wasn't good enough. We had to do it over. So we did it over again. We spent a lot of nights just going over and over and counting and counting. And and then in the meantime, somebody would have two more kids and we have to start over again, you know. But we did do that, and then we sent it back. And it was a long time before they finally accepted it, and finally they said, we did the same thing, and we'll just have to go with your figures. So if you're mad at the wards and how many people's in it, we did it. And we did it because we did it the only way we knew how. And they did accept it, and from there everything just began to explode. He also, I don't know if any of you know this or not, he also called the finance department head in Carson City, which is a good friend of his, and asked if they would give us money to help start the city. And they promised him $100,000. And, <clears throat> well, that was good with our tax money that we could gather and when we could we could start a city with that hundred thousand dollars we could get started well as you know Harley run for mayor he didn't make it he was third and that's okay but we're still we're still surviving and anyway he told I'm not going to tell you this I'm going to keep this to myself anyway Eventually, they got around to calling the legislature about some money, and they did give them $50,000 to go, but they did promise hardly $100,000. Um, what else do you want to know? We're into a city now. We've organized it. We've got our I think it's just important to have on record that, uh, you know, uh, probably, like I said, the most important pusher of the city, the one that pushed for a long, long, long time for others, ever jumped into it. Well, I have to tell you about all these, whoa, maybe I shouldn't. <laughs> Others were trying to do something and they would take a, a city 
uh, van and about six of them ride down and I figured it probably cost them 20 cents each for the gas and we went in our car and we made a lot of trips. I even helped pick the carpet out that went in the first city hall. Well, we don't mind that. And Okay, have I said enough? <laughs> okay, uh, we're just about, I'd like to go about another 15 minutes if we can. And, uh, just, just kind of pers perspective. Katie, can you remember where you were when President Kennedy was shot, killed? I was in Cedar City. Doing what? Um, I mean, why were you in Cedar? Up there shopping or what? No. At that time we were at school. My husband was going to school and we were up there. Okay. And there was a snowstorm. And we didn't have a TV. We had a TV, but it was broke. It was in the shop more than it was out. And we were driving down the road, and we heard the news, and we couldn't believe it. Okay. So we ran over to your place and watched it on TV. <laughs> <laughs> I had been down. Uh, you know how it is when you go to school. You never have any money, and uh, we didn't have any food. So I'd been out hunting rabbits, <laughs> and the bells kept ringing, and I couldn't figure out why. The big bells up in Cedar City were ringing all about, so I come home to find out. <clears throat> Where were you, Will Vernon? What? When Kennedy got shot, President Kennedy? I was stopped at the stop sign just on uh, Fifth Street in Las Vegas, waiting for the light to turn, and somebody in a picket club up and waved at us, and I rolled the window down, and he told me that, and I didn't believe him. So I turned on the radio, and they were screaming over, that's where I was in Las Vegas that day. And can either one of you remember what it was like when you come home that week or when you come home that night? How did people in the valleys, can you remember what, what did you feel any difference? Or? If I remember right, it was, you know, we didn't any of us feel like doing anything. We were just kind of listless and wondering how could this happen and even then when he was taken to the hospital we had a little hope maybe they would bring him to life but they didn't and um, we watched everything on TV I didn't miss one thing boy I was right there to see everything on TV that I could but you know it didn't make us feel any better I just remember that there were meetings scheduled I think even a dance that weekend, they just canceled everything. Mm -hmm. Like you say, people just didn't feel like doing anything except sitting in the house and watching TV. Uh, one other thing, during the Vietnam War, uh, there was a lot of demonstrations. The hippie movement was big in California, across the nation. Uh, people were demonstrating against the war, all that kind of stuff. Can you remember what things were like in Mesquite? Were people here boisterous against the war, or were they, can you remember? They weren't. There was just, I know one. We were a little town, and we didn't really, you know, some of our men had to go out to war, but it wasn't, it was war. I mean, they didn't want to go, but they didn't have a choice, and so they went. So, it didn't change too much. Well, you know, war does change, but we was only a small town. It hadn't grown then. Still had dirt roads and one oil road down through town. Uh, you remember any other thing about it, Laura? Well, I know two or three young men went, and they had been in my Sunday school class, some of them, and well, I guess they're still in my Sunday school class because every time they see me, I think about them. And I don't think we lost any of our boys in the Vietnam War, but it wasn't good. And I do know one from here that went to Canada to escape. And whether he ever came back or not, I don't know. But he did go just to get, keep from going. It was not a popular war for anybody. Did the feelings of Mesquite that you remember, the valley that you remember about the Vietnam War, how would they compare with what you perceive the vet feelings to be with the Iraq War? In support of government is what I'm talking about here, I'm asking. Um, 
I'm not asking whether you support it, I'm just saying generally. Was, were the people in the valley supporting Well, the all I could do or? was, like everybody else, was listen to what they told me and hopefully that they wouldn't take any more of our young people because there were a lot of our young people from here that went in that war and also people that we knew that went. And we knew that they were in, in depth of a lot of things, but how did we know really what it was and we just didn't like it? I think one of the reasons is then they were you you were drafted and, and now you're not drafted. Because right. everybody was worrying for fear they were gonna be drafted. And that was a worry. And I know one of John's relation, he got wounded really bad. And he's gonna have to live with it the rest of his life. And so it really wasn't a good war. But like I said, you were drafted. I uh, I I've heard people comment, not necessarily valley people, but they've made, I've heard the comment that little towns like this really didn't participate in the wars very much because, you know, they didn't, they didn't have many people here. It wasn't like the participation of New York City or Los Angeles. But uh, I don't think that there's probably any city around that participated any more than this valley that participated, not any. Uh, this valley at the time World War II started had approximately, I, I was looking at that tonight, had approximately 700 people, 698, something like that. Men, women, and children. That was Littlefield, Beaver Dam, Bunkerville, Mesquite, Riverside. And there's almost 140 men left to go to the war. Now, if you consider 600 people, or yeah, 600 people, close to 700, and uh, half of those are going to be women. A bunch of those are going to be kids. That doesn't leave a whole lot of people, men, home during the time the war was on that didn't go one blood time or another. Uh, one last thing, question, let's see. I have questions we could go for three days here, but. What do you feel like is probably uh, if you could see Mesquite get anything it wanted right now or within the next 10 years, what would you like to see Mesquite get as far as businesses or things this way that it does not have now? We have a Walmart. What did you want any more than that? Yeah. Well, we've lived here all our life, and, and we love it. And, you know, what comes will well, come. Yeah, That's I, all there is to it. I, it's interesting to me oh, because me. as Katie and I are both the same age, and so growing up, yeah, they had places in St. George that were fancier than ours, but this was as best there was any place. But I can remember thinking, you know, Man, it'd be good if we ever get a McDonald's here. Well, we have one. And it'd be great if we didn't have to run to St. Charles to go to the drugstore, and we don't. And uh, I thought probably the last thing that would ever come to Mesquite, you know, and that finally one day would come, maybe, would be a little hospital, and now we have that. So I'm wondering, well, all these things that we just didn't think of because, you know, we'd never grown up with them, so we didn't really think about them. About the only thing I can think of now that I would like to see comes an olive garden, but I <laughs> or Wendy's. Or I, I hope there was an olive garden coming in one of the casinos. I don't know if it's in the casino. That's not doing me any good. <laughs> if I have to get up, walk out a mile to go to into an olive garden, I won't do it. Won't do it. But uh, if one last comment from each of you about what you feel about your life in Mesquite. Yeah, to sum it all up, Wolverna, what would you say about your life here in this valley? I mean, I look at this, and you were both lived up here on this corner, a block and a half away. And now you live about two blocks from that, and you live about four blocks from that. And you're still here, you know, I know you've been all over the world and all of that stuff, but, but you still stay here. So in this little valley town of Mesquite, 
Well, how would you summarize your life? <laughs> I'm glad I'm here. I have been blessed so much by being here. How do I know where I, if I would be alive if I lived somewhere else? Here, they all look after me and take care of me. And, and you know, like, I don't know anything different than the, the mesquite, and I don't want to. And all these things that we now have, we made adjustments and lived without them because we didn't know any different. And when they came, we, then we were glad to have them. But, you know, we didn't have them. Like I told you, my older sister was born with a midwife and didn't even have a birth certificate. So when mom had me, she made it, and she had a doctor, she made out a birth certificate for both of us. <laughs> and this is probably not what you wanted to hear, but my sister and her wanted to go on a trip. She was gonna go on a very, very good trip. And she was sent to Carson City for her uh, birth certificate, see if she had one, and sure enough, she had one. She said, bless my mother's heart, when I was born, she made us both a birth certificate and sent them in together so they didn't have to get her born. So you see, we took care of things. Jamie. I wouldn't live anywhere else. Oh, I don't want to live anywhere else. I don't plan on it. Katie? I love mesquite. I, was, I wasn't born here, but I was raised here, and I'm still here. And my husband was um, born in Overton, and he's lived here all his life. And, his parents were from here, and John tried to move me away a couple of times. He tried to move me to St. George, and we just all laughed at him. And he tried to move us to Overton, and we just laughed at him, and we're still here. And I love it when people ask me, well, and I say, well, I've lived here all my life, and I love it, and I don't want to go anyplace. I go on a vacation, and I think, man, I can't wait to get home. I don't, somebody says, well, it's too hot here in the summer, and I says, well, Use your air conditioner. Stay inside. <laughs> if it's cold, you use a heater. <laughs> so. That, that is kind of, you mentioned that, uh, it, it bothers me a little bit too. It's, it's like if you were born in St. George and you're really not native, you know. But that's the only place you could go to a doctor. So I was born in St. George and I sure didn't live there. If you were born in, if you didn't live there, it's just that that's where they went to get you born and then brought you home. So. Do any of you out in the audience have any questions you'd like to ask these two young ladies? When Miss Laverna said that her, what did she mean by going to take the baby to get named? Oh, uh, you want to answer that? What do you mean by get the baby, baby named? What? In the church, we take our babies up to the front, and the men that hold the priesthood um, say the prayer and give them a name. Well, Mom said, if you want to take this little boy up to these men and have him, them give him a name, you can name him Bert. But if you don't, then he's, not, he's going to be named Frenchy. Well, he was named Frenchy. I'd like Will Bernard to tell a little bit about Harley's experiences in the legislature because the connections that he made and the hard work that he did during those years have, we, Mesquite benefited a lot from those. And I mean, I don't remember Mesquite being, having representation that much. You know, anyone else? I can remember, you know, some later, but Harley was it. Harley represented this, this valley. You say so? <laughs> well, <coughs> let's see if Harley knew the right people. How's that? And he knew the county commissioners, he went to see them if he wanted something for the town. He wasn't backward about going to see them. I remember one time when he was on the board with the power company, he says, I waltzed into Nevada Power and they had that big long table and I was in my Levi's and I looked around and decided I was in the wrong place. <laughs> well, anyway, he did know how to uh, get into these politics. Our house was just a wayside that was full all the time. Since he did know these county commissioners, there were many people that came to the house and asked him to get them a job. Now, at this particular time, Mercury was uh, 
what do you call it? Test site. Well, it was a test site, but they were rolling in money out there, and if you got a job out to the test site, you had it made. Hardly knew the people that could get him a job, get them a job out to the test site. I'm not going to make any names on those, but I do know the people that went through our house. Geraldine, that's why I changed my kitchen around, because we were so open to the public that when we pushed the kitchen out, I turned it around so they couldn't see in our kitchen when we ate. That was a sideline. But anyway, we had politicians in our house. Howard Cannon was there, I remember. He was a big man, well, physically too. And he was on buttermilk with a diet. Forgive my outside lines. And there were, there were people there all the time. We were just an open house all the time. And having that big house, I guess they thought it was okay to just come and go. And when they came in the side door, they could see in our kitchen, so I took care of that. I put a left-hand pull on my refrigerator so it could open the other way. And I uh, had salesmen that came, and some of them came to the garage and couldn't get home at night. We poured them into our back bedroom and helped them get on their way the next morning. But our house was open to the public all the time. We just had company, company, company. And, oh, I fed a lot of them, so if I don't cook for you, that's fine. <laughs> uh, but we were open house all the time. There was always somebody there, plus our kids. Our kids had, and then another sideline, the high school made their floats out in our backyard. Um, hardly knew where to go and who to go see, especially for the town. He was always concerned about Mesquite. And it, I didn't even think about moving, but he wouldn't have moved me out of Mesquite if I would have. Never mind. Is that enough? Uh, any more questions? We were we involved in politics, yes. We haven't asked you about how many children you have and grandchildren. Over and how many children did you have? Four. Four, and how many are here tonight? Three. Three we did three. lose our sweetheart, but we I have twenty-five grandchildren and I think last count I had twenty-seven great. That's great, isn't it? Yes. <laughs> Katie, how about you and John? <laughs> I have seven children. I have five boys and two girls. And I have 18 grandchildren and um, one great grandchild. And I still, I've still got more to come because I've got some that haven't had any. I've got one that's not married. So, <laughs> and my husband passed away four years ago. So, um, I live alone with the dog. But I'm never alone. My family checks in on me, and my cells rang about four times since I've been up here. So I'm sure they're all wondering where I am because they don't know. Well, Charlie knows, but that's who I'm. So when I get home, I'll probably have a lot of calls. <laughs> I have three boys that live here. So. And uh, all of yours live down the valley, or does David? You live in Vegas. I live in Vegas. Vegas. They're here tonight. Janet. Terry and Janet. And Terry both live down the valley. Tammy's here also. Tammy's here. Hi, Tammy. <laughs> okay, any more questions? If not, we'll, unless there's anything you two would like to say, we'll.
I got it. Okay. We've got him. We we take our money to care for the bar.